Now, in a moment, we'll be talking to the Energy and Climate Change Minister, Greg Barker, about today's developments. But first, to the other half of his brief. On Monday, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change will reveal its first update in seven years on the future impact of global warming. The report is widely expected to strike a very pessimistic note, with warnings that millions of people could be displaced by flooding and food supplies could be under threat. Well, our science editor, Tom Clark, is with me. So tell me a little bit more about what you think the report's going to say. Well, Cathy, this report in many ways is some of what's in it is depressingly familiar stuff. But the scientific community are now saying it with more confidence and with more accurate predictions than we've had before. Key headlines, things like our, the planet's ability to grow food is expected to be reduced as it gets warmer. That coming at a time when global demand for food is only going up. There's things like sea level rise. That's only going to get worse. As we saw with our recent experience with floods and storms, and last year on the other end of the spectrum, that devastating typhoon in the Philippines, just a few inches more of sea level rise can magnify the catastrophic effects of a storm. The report also finds, perhaps not surprisingly, it's the world's poorest that are most vulnerable to climate change, also the most unable to adapt to the impacts it has. We in rich countries can afford to sort of pay our way out of most of the things the planet might throw at us, but we mustn't forget that we buy and sell things with poorer countries. Who's going to make our mobile phones stitch our cheap Christmas jumpers if their house keeps getting washed into the sea? So what's being done about all of this? Well, at the moment, the big picture is we are gearing up for another <coughs> big global climate change summit. There is horse trading going on right now about how rich countries should go about reducing their emissions but maintaining growth, but also how they should help poorer countries not make the mistakes that we make. Also, big questions given this question of adaptation about whether we should pay them to cope with the threats that the climate change argument we caused is going to throw at them. Um, also, we mustn't forget that governments in the West, our own included, are not going to these global climate negotiations with anything like the moral high ground they once stood on. We've been having to junk a lot of green policies in order to balance the books. Efforts to try and keep energy bills down by reducing perhaps green policies to help you know, cash-strapped voters at a crucial time. Now, I was in Greenland a couple of years ago reporting about the impact that its rapid warming is having, potentially on sea level rise. Um, and today, UN Secretary General, building up to that big global negotiation process, is there to see things for himself, and Jon Snow happens to be there with him. Crisis in Crimea, death in Syria. What on earth is a UN Secretary General doing flying into Greenland at such a moment? Ban Ki-moon is bent upon making a very big point. He's here not to talk guns, intimidation or religious fundamentalism, but to urge the world to take drastic action over a much bigger crisis that has the potential to affect us all. And the focus of that potential is right here beneath the morass of glaciers and fjords that flood across this land and which until now have frozen solid winter by winter. Thirty years ago, the ice in this fjord was measured at a depth of one metre. Today, it's just 30 to 40 centimetres. That's what's happened in this inland water in just a period of 30 years. Out across the horizon here, Greenland's polar ice cap. In the last 10 years alone, it has retreated by 12 and a half miles, shedding 10 billion tonnes of water in doing so. And so here is Mr. Ban venturing further into the Arctic Circle than any UN Secretary General before him. He's armed with a devastating climate change report to be published on Monday. As we fly ever nearer the North Pole, there's time for the Danish Prime Minister to bag another selfie and the UN Secretary General himself to penetrate the cockpit, leaving his wife to experience an unforgettable landing. Lit by a setting sun, this heavenly landscape disguises terrifying facts. Amid the breakup of this sheet ice, the smashing of icebergs and the warming of its waters, the consequences in the next half century for the eighth of the world living in coastal lands is positively frightening. From Bangladesh to the Somerset levels, life will become unsustainable. Populations will heave and move. It will all be brutally detailed in Monday's UN report. I'm here to learn more about climate change. And, and to uh, push the cause. Yes, of course. Tomorrow, we join Mr. Mann on the glaciers. 
These resting huskies will be straining at other leashes, towing dog sleds, upon one of which will sit the UN Secretary General. He wants the awakening to climate change to be his legacy. And if it takes a dog sled team to help him do it, so be it. And that in the end is why Ban Ki-moon is here, because he believes that this is the greatest threat to mankind's capacity to live together in harmony on this planet. Because anybody living in a coastal region is going to be affected by this. An eighth of the world's population lives in those coastal regions. And they are going to be afflicted first by the consequences of that melting. When it melts, it raises the sea level. And eventually that sea level is going to engulf not just the Somerset levels, but huge countries like Bangladesh. Great populations will be on the move. And on Monday of this coming week, the UN will publish a projection of the consequences of what is happening there. And that projection is painful to read indeed.